Hello and welcome to Writer's Book Club. I'm your host, Michelle Barraclough, and each month I take a deep dive with an author into the writing craft and process behind one of their books. This was my last author interview of 2022, and just like the previous year with Marcus Zusak, I wanted to bring you a chat with a really accomplished author that spans across their entire writing career, rather than focusing on just one book. So I'm delighted to bring master storyteller, Kate Forsyth to your ears in this episode. Kate has written something like 46 books and wow, she really knows a thing or two about writing. Before we dive into the interview, I'd like to take this chance to thank all of you, my delightful, loyal listeners for tuning in each month throughout 2022. Thank you for sending in your questions, entering the book giveaways and leaving your gorgeous reviews on Apple Podcasts. You really are such a beautiful bunch. And of course, a huge thanks to the fabulous authors who've given so graciously of their time in 2022. I don't know about you, but I've learned so much about the craft of writing from this year's guests and what a stellar lineup we've had. Ashley Collegian Blunt, Penelope Janu, Hannah Kent, Tony Jordan, Nigel Featherston, Pamela Cook, Michael Robotham, John Purcell, Mark Smith, Caroline Overington, Rachel Johns, and today's guest, Kate Forsyth. Thank you so, so much to all of those authors for very generously giving up their time and their wisdom. I've really outdone myself on this episode length. Um, Do feel free to listen over a few sessions or just binge it in one big long walk or even a road trip if you're on holidays. Kate and I had a really wide-ranging chat covering everything from how she structures her novels, how she chooses point of view, her research methods, what her editing process looks like, and how ideas for her books come together, sometimes with a little bit of time travel and magic. Let me tell you about Kate. Dr. Kate Forsyth is an award-winning author, poet, and storyteller. She has a Doctorate of Creative Arts in Fairy Tale Studies, which has led to an amazing body of novels inspired by fairy tales and myths, but definitely not as you know them. Her most recent novel is The Crimson Thread, which uses the Minotaur in the Labyrinth myth as part of its inspiration. The Crimson Thread is set in Crete during the Nazi invasion and occupation of World War II. Kate's other historical novels include Beauty and Thorns, which is a reimagining of Sleeping Beauty told in the voices of four women of the pre-Raphaelite circle of artists and poets. Then we have The Wild Girl, the story of the forbidden romance behind the Grimm Brothers fairy tales, which was named most memorable love story of 2013. And Bitter Greens, which is a reinvention of Rapunzel, which won the 2015 American Library Association Award for Best Historical Fiction. Kate has also written non-fiction books, books for middle grade children and picture books, many of which have garnered awards. She's pretty extraordinary and I can't wait to dive into the craft and process she brings to her writing. As Susan Vreeland said about Kate, surrender yourself to a master storyteller. Kate Forsyth, thank you so much for joining me today. It's so delightful to have you here for the last episode of the season. It is such a pleasure to be with you, Michelle. Thank you for having me. Kate, I can't think of anyone better to take us out with a big, rambling, dreamy, wonderful chat about writing because you are so accomplished. You write across so many genres. You're a poet, you're a novelist, you write nonfiction. Your blog is just a a rabbit hole that every writer should go down. Um, I I wouldn't be surprised if you're also a songwriter. Um, There's so much that you have done. And you're also a writing teacher, so uh, so much to learn from this episode. Thank you so much. Yes, I do love to write, and uh, I see no reason why I can't write across all genres and across all forms. <laughs> yes, because you write picture books and middle grade books as well. I do, I do, and short stories and essays. <laughs> and I have written songs, I must admit. <laughs> oh, I knew it. <laughs> that doesn't surprise me at all. So we're going to, oh gosh, where do we start, Kate? I was going to mainly look at The Crimson Thread because that's your latest novel that's just come out. And so I'd love to be able to refer to that throughout our chat. But as you know, I've invited you to just touch on any of your works. Uh, So as we talk through the various craft aspects of writing, 
um, for you to just delve into any of your work and just pluck out examples that you think would be the most helpful to the listeners who are mainly writers. I, I'm sure there are a few readers in there as well, but um, mainly writers, aspiring writers. And we also have a lot of really experienced writers who listen as well. So um, please feel free to just dive into any of your work. I wanted to start with how you get the inspiration for your novels. How do you know you have an idea that will stick? All right. So I'm going to divide that question into two. Great. Um, inspiration. The incredibly uh, powerful and mysterious charge that comes when an idea, um, like a, you know, hits you like a bolt out of the blue. Where does it come from? And of course, none of us really do know. Um, I, I believe that inspiration arises out of a strong sense of curiosity about the world and engagement with the world and um, a sense of always searching to see the world with clear new eyes, I think that inspiration arises out of stories. Um, for me, um, once an idea has taken possession of my imagination, it possesses me and I become completely obsessed with it and fascinated by it. And I think that level of obsession is really, really important because, um, you know, any long form creative project is a long, slow marathon, and you need to have enough creative energy in the idea to sustain you and keep you engaged and interested, sometimes for years. Um, I'm asked this question a lot, and if I was to tell you where the idea for every single one of my books came, you know, comes from, that they are all very, very different, and they are all long explanations, because it's not just one idea. It's a constellation of ideas that all create some kind of energy between them, a kind of magnetic force. So when people ask me, how do you know if it's a good idea? I simply say, how excited about it are you? Is it keeping you up at night? Are you thinking about it in, in all your, you know, spare moments? And is it generating new ideas? Is it beginning to generate narrative? And by that, do you start inventing character and situation and do you start exploring settings and do you start beginning to hear your character speak in your mind's ear? Now, if all those things are happening, then it's a good idea. If none of those things are happening, then you're not ready yet for that idea or this idea is not for you. And so people come to me all the time and say, okay, I've got the best idea for you. And then I listen very politely and very patiently. And then I either say one of two things to them. I either say, yes, it's a brilliant idea and you so have to write it. Or I say, you better write it damn fast because I actually like this idea and I'm going to steal it if you don't start writing it soon. <laughs> they shouldn't tell you if they want to keep it for themselves. No, that's exactly right. But a lot of people don't have the faith in themselves. Um, or in their ability. And so they're, you know, they're completely fascinated and obsessed with this story idea. But because they don't have the accompanying faith, they feel that they have to give the idea away. So instead, I prefer to try and help them find, find their own faith in themselves. Oh, you're a true teacher in that respect, Kate. Um, reading the Crimson Thread and reading through the acknowledgements, the idea I see it came from very personal circumstances for this book. And I'm, I gather that they're not all as personal to you because this one was inspired by your grandfather and then that sent you down different rabbit holes with Greek mythology. Um, they're not all as personal as this, are they? Not in that respect, but you can't write a book of any sort. You can't write a story without drawing upon your own life experiences, your own belief systems, your own dreams and imaginings. And so any book that I write is deeply, deeply personal in one way or another. And that is one of the reasons why it's hard to explain in a soundbite where inspiration comes from, because nearly always it's a lifelong preoccupation with something 
with uh, a set of circumstances or with you know something that speaks to you very very powerfully. The Italian film director Federico Fellini said, "All art is autobiography. The pearl is the oyster's autobiography." And I really, really love that. I believe that this is true. All art is autobiographical because we have nothing else to draw upon. However, no art is only autobiography, I believe. And so what I think we do is is we take everything that we've read and seen and heard and felt and experienced and then we, we transform it in the crucible of the imagination into something very different. But it still carries within it the the seeds of the idea, the thing that speaks to us so powerfully. Yeah. So that really interests me. Yeah. I just loved reading those acknowledgements. You love myths, you love legends, you love fairy tales. So you've been able to bring that in. You've brought in your grandfather's story and, and his brother's story and these stories from the war. And we'll touch on your research later because that's a whole other beast but I loved seeing how all those threads came together. Thank you so much. So The Crimson Thread is a historical novel for adults which is set in Crete during World War II. It begins with the Nazi invasion of May 1941 and it finishes with the Nazi surrender in um, April 1945. So that's four years um, of the island of Crete, living under the Nazi jackboot of op- occupation. Um, I first got interested in this story when I was about 13 or 14 years old, and I was sent down to spend the summer with my grandparents in Melbourne while my parents um, went through a rather ugly divorce. Um, it was the first time I'd ever been um, sent to stay with my grandparents by, my, in, by myself, And um, it was obviously a difficult emotional time for me. So unsurprisingly, Michelle, as you know, I'm a big, big reader. And when I go away, I generally fill my bag with books rather than with clothes. But I did nothing but read while I was down there. It was a scorching hot summer. And I spent all day lying on the bed in my bedroom, sucking on ice and drinking lemon in iced water and reading And I read all the books I'd taken with me within the first couple of days. Um, I asked my grandmother if she had any any books that I could read. And she dug out a box of um, kids' books that belonged to my father and my aunts and uncles, um, which hadn't seen the light of of the day for a very long time. Um, The first book that I read out of that box of books was called The Chalet School in Exile. And it was about... uh, a British school um, in the Austrian Alps when um, during the Anschluss, when um, Germany annexed Austria. And um, the heroine of the story rescues an old Jewish man from some Hitler youth thugs. And as a result, she and um, her friends have to escape through the Austrian Alps. It's this incredibly exciting kind of, you know, girl's school own story. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that night at dinner, I was all quite animated and excited telling my grandparents the story of this dramatic escape through the Austrian Alps being hunted by the Nazis. And my grandfather told me that my great uncle had um, actually lived a very similar experience. When he was a young man, only 22 years old, He had been fighting in Greece and Germany had sent him the Wehrmacht. And so the Australian soldiers had retreated to Crete and they were there on Crete when it was invaded in May 1941. And there followed a very bitter and bloody um, battle that lasted for 11 days. It's one of the most um, ferocious battles of World War II. And the Germans came so close to losing. And if they had lost, it would have been the first victory of the war and history might have been different. But the Australians just couldn't quite hang on and they lost the battle. They had to retreat over the towering white mountains of Crete, which are not as tall as the Austrian Alps, 
but they are immensely desolate, bare, wild, and cold. My great uncle um, had like had any clothes, no shoes, um, no food. They were fleeing and being bombed and machine gunned. They escaped to the other side of Crete, which is the south coast, and then they had um, to wait to be evacuated. And just like Dunkirk, this most famous evacuation of World War II, um, it was a desperate um, attempt to try and save as many um, Allied soldiers as possible. My great uncle had to hide in the cave while the Germans hunted for him. And apparently it was a family joke. That was a good thing. He was so skinny because um, if he'd been fatter, he couldn't have fit it inside the crack where he had to hide. Um, the Australians, um, his battalion was the last boat to leave Crete and, um, half of the battalion was left behind to be taken prisoner by the Germans. And my great uncle's, um, commanding officer, when he realized that his men were being abandoned, he, he stood up and he dived overboard and he swam back to shore and he was taken prisoner along with half of his men. And they spent the rest of the war in a, in a camp, a bit of war camp. So this is a story that my grandfather told me when I was only 13 years old. And it triggered for me, um, a lifelong fascination with World War II and with Crete. Now, the very next day after reading, after hearing this story, I read, um, Tales of the Greek Heroes by Roger Lanceling Green which includes the story of the Minotaur and the Labyrinth myth, which is based in Crete. And the juxtaposition of re- of these two stories, so close in time, it cemented Crete in my imagination as a place of danger, um, mystery, and magic. So that was the very first seed of an idea. And I've carried that fascination with those two elements with me all of my life. And have continued to feed them, you know, with my love of myths and with my love of Greece. Gosh, what are the odds that those two books would come into your life at the same time, plus your grandfather telling you that story? And that has all coalesced into this kernel of a story that a couple of decades later, let's say, you have now brought to life on the page. Like just as you were describing those white mountains in Crete, I because I've only just finished, I, I like to read the books as close to the interview as possible so that it's really fresh in my mind. And okay, you just brought it all to life. It's, it's magic. It's an incredible book, so full of the rich detail as well, which we will get to in terms of the research, because some of those things that you found out and included in the book are pretty extraordinary. What comes first? I mean, you have all these threads that you've carried with you for a number of years. So why now for this story? What what happened that you thought, well, this is the time now to bring this story to life? I have been um, thinking about uh, doing something with um, the, the story of Greece in World War II for quite a long time. I have written another World War II um, historical novel called The Beast Garden, which is set in, in Berlin, um, you know, the nerve centre of the Nazi war machine. Um, and it's inspired by the true story of the women of the underground resistance to Hitler in Berlin during World War II. Um, and th- that was the most harrowing book and the most difficult book that I have ever written. And so after writing that, I needed to have a little bit of a rest, I think. Um, and so I wrote other books that were also, um, equally, you know, um, interesting and fascinating to me. But the back of my mind was always this idea that one day I might like to write a story about Greece and Crete. Um, it wasn't really, though, until um, I was on tour for my novel, The Blue Rose, and um, I, I, I toured for months with that one, and I was going out to a lot of towns, you know, regional Australia, and um I was giving a presentation, I think it's in Albury, um, and I got there 
um, it's a big old country town with a big wide central road. And um, I missed the turn off to my hotel. And so I had to that drive through the town to turn around and come back. And as I drove to the other end of the town, I saw my favorite kind of shop, which <laughs> is a little old, shadowy, cobwebby secondhand bookstore. Oh, yes, and, my favorite too. <laughs> yeah, I love them. My idea of a perfect holiday is to go somewhere where they have one of these. And there was a car park right outside that I could just drive. My car just slid into this car park. So I spent a happy hour rummaging around and it was a treasure trove. And I bought, I found this incredible first edition copy of Tanglewood Tales by Nathaniel Hawthorne. And I collect old volumes. If you look behind me in my bookshelf over there is my collection of myths and fairy tales. And I, I like the very old ones because they're beautiful, because they look magical. Yeah. And because the fairy tales in them have not been Disneyfied, that makes sense. Perfect. So anyway, you have probably know of Nathaniel Hawthorne as the author of The Scarlet Letter. Yes. But he, this particular book is, is famous as a retelling of Greek myths for children. It was written in like the 1880s. So I bought it. It cost me a fortune, but I couldn't not have it. I actually had already had one of the paintings out of it framed oh. on my wall. That's how much I love this book. Anyway, that night after my literary dinner, I went back to my hotel room and I, I got in my jammies, crawled into bed, and I began to read Tanglewood Tales. And when I got, when I was reading the story of the Minotaur and the Labyrinth book, it had this phrase, you know, something about, um, and when Theseus saw the far off blue mountains of Crete, he felt a shiver of fear down his spine. And I just went, Crete, Minotaur, World War II. It just reminded me. I'm guessing of, you felt a shiver as well. I felt, I, I do. I, um, I felt everything very strongly in my body, which means that I, you know, all the hairs were standing up on my arms. So I grabbed my diary and I scribbled in it. Crete, World War II, Minotaur. And then the next day, I did a bit of Googling, did a little bit of ideas, and by the end of the week, I pitched the novel idea to my publishers. Right. And they loved it. And they so loved it. that's how it happened. The idea had been slumbering in my subconscious yes. for 40 years, and then um, one day this trigger, this one line that I read in an old book, just sparked it back into life again. Yep, now's the time. Now is the time, that's right. In a dusty bookshop in Albury. I love it. Albury um, is one of those classic old Australian towns, isn't it? It's gorgeous. It is. It really, really is. And, um, you know, what I love about this particular story is what you were saying before, is that um, it's a chain effect of small sparks that come at exactly the right time to trigger something. That's how inspiration works. I often use this kind of chemical reaction metaphor. Sometimes I use the, you know, um, the seed of an idea, but it needs to fall on fertile ground. Yes. And so both those metaphors, I think, work really, really well. You can come so close to not getting the idea. Yes. There hadn't been a car park. Oh, we might not have had the crimson thread just yet. It might have come in another way. Um, But it's interesting you're talking about a country town like Albury because Jack and Teddy in the novel, I've had a town like Albury in my head. Yeah, exactly right. So they both come from Macedon, so near Hanging Rock. I had a couple of reasons for that. One was that my great uncle who I wish to honour in the story, was a Victorian boy, came from a country town in Victoria, and as a consequence, he was part of this battalion um, where the commanding officer um, sacrificed his own freedom in order to go into captivity with his men. I mean, just telling that story, I get choked up every single time because it's uh, 
it's what the book is all, all about. It's all about courage and struggle and sacrifice and makeshift and this kind of defiance of spirit, which is what drew me to the story in the first place. Um, just going back to but when I was talking about having a constellation of ideas, um, one of the things that I, I discovered on my very first morning of, of Googling and playing with ideas, um, one of the reasons I wouldn't really have wanted to write my great uncle's story before is because it's a man's story and I'm interested in women's stories. Um, and so um, I needed to find uh, a central female character before the story was going to be able to work for me. And one of the very first things that I, I discovered and which I wrote in my diary, you know, that very day was that um, because most of the Cretan army had been taken prisoner on the mainland of Greece and because the, um, the Nazi reprisals were so horrific, so severe, so many, many villages had every male above the age of 12 was executed. So there were no, there were very few young men. And that meant that women played, I mean, they were fighting alongside, um, the Allied soldiers. But, and then all those Allied soldiers who were left behind on the island, the women were hiding them at in, in incredible risk to themselves. And then the, the resistance was mainly run by women. And that, as soon as I read that, I, I, I had my yeah. story and I had my, my central character and they're like the most important things you need when you're writing a book. Setting your protagonist, the problem or dilemma. And w once you have those things, then the story begins to fall very, very swiftly yes. into place. And you said in the author's note that you had seen a photograph of two um, women on Crete, a mother and a daughter, holding guns. Yeah. I I wanted them to put the photograph into the book, but one, we don't know who took the photograph, so we can't credit it, and two, it would have added exponentially to the cost of the book. But I do have it on my website for anyone who, who's interested. Um, as soon as I saw this photograph, I knew I had a story to tell because the mother is... Um, this looks like your classic Greek woman, you know, dressed all in black with a kind of headscarf over her head. And her face is so, so sorrowful. And there she is, this, this, this Greek mother holding a machine gun. And standing next to her is her daughter, who is so young and so fresh faced and dressed in like a pretty little sprigged muslin frock with a hair in a classic 1940s style holding a gun and I I just knew I mean even talking about it I don't know if you can see I've got this so have I uh, those women what they had to put up with they, there's a lot of detail in there about what they went through um and it's horrific it really was just horrific but you can understand that fighting spirit and the way that they would want to protect their own and to fight back that bravery and that what did you call it before that defiance, defiance of spirit that, yeah yeah that really yeah. came across I was really really drawn to that and of course it's a great untold story and I'm always interested in stories that that, that are untold I'm not really interested in telling stories that I've told before and just doing it the same story in a slightly different form that doesn't have enough um grit to the tale to keep me interested for so long. And so I'm not really interested in, in telling stories that other people have told as well. I'm always drawn to discovering and bringing to life stories that should not be forgotten. I guess that's one of the benefits, <laughs> if there is a silver lining to be had of so many stories being told through the male lens over the centuries, is that there's a treasure trove of untold women's stories for novelists like yourself and um, Natasha Lester and those sorts of yeah. novelists to go in and just discover and bring to life. I'm always drawn to the story, um, to stories of outsiders, of, of people who perhaps have been silenced or have been unable to find their voice and who have these struggles which um, 
are not always clearly understood. And so, you know, women are very much a part of that for me, you know, being a flag carrying feminist as I am. But I'm also drawn to, to, to creative artists and to people who um, are, are struggling in, in some way or another. This may be because of my own personal history. So, for example, in, in the Crimson Thread, um, my, uh, one of my central male characters is Jack, who is very much inspired by my own grandfather. But I gave to him my own stutter. So um, I've struggled with a speech disability all of my life. I think it's rather glorious and ironic that I make so much of my living from public speaking when this was has always been my very worst nightmare. And I give to Jack both my own speech impediments and my own journey to learn how to overcome them. So Jack is not what you would think of as being your classic, you know, male hero, you know, larrikin Aussie soldier, confident um, and brave. He's a far more complex and sensitive character. That is far more interesting to me than um, a more stereotypical type character, I suppose. I love um, Jack. I defy anyone to read this novel and not fall in love with Jack. He's just gorgeous. Um and I should also say, Kate, your essay that you wrote about Marilyn Monroe and her stutter and talked about your own journey was just such a beautiful piece. And I, I'm going to put a link to that in the show notes because I think that's well worth listening to. I've also heard you talk to Richard Feidler on conversation about it as well. And it's it's such a, a beautiful story. And you're you're so generous sharing that personal side of your life. Oh, thank you so much. The, the, um, article about Marilyn Monroe was, um, just such a fascinating, you know, I am an ex-journalist and when I was a journalist, I was a feature journalist and the personal essay is one of my preferred creative modes. I have, you know, I've been writing them for a very, very long time. Um, and it just seemed the perfect time to write it because, um, it was the anniversary of her death. So, uh, you know, I had known about it for a long time, but then I, I was just very aware that it was an untold, another untold story. Um, and it, it shed, um, a, a new light on her character. And of course, I, I knew that they were bringing out the blonde Netflix series. So, you know, um, it would just seem like a good time to do this story that I had been thinking about for quite a long time as well. And of course, people do find it fascinating, but it's a conjunction of these two things that make it most interesting. My story and her story make it, I think, much more engaging than if I was just writing a story just about her. Yes, I agree. So I guess with your all your books, all your work, including your essays, that you're always just very open to ideas coalescing coming in, that constellation of ideas. Would you say that that is something a writer really needs to develop? Yes. So I I often say to aspiring authors, um, ideas are everything. Ideas are a writer's currency. Um, And you need to learn how to um, recognize and discover story ideas. Now, I have a lot of people who come to me for help and, um, and most of those who are struggling with their craft uh, fall into two very, very different landscapes of difficulty. So on the one hand, we have, um, writers who are compelled to write and who are so overwhelmed by the chaos of their I- imaginations that they um, are constantly getting new ideas, constantly having characters taking over their stories and, um, and their, and their narratives turning into like these, um, you know, monsters with 17 heads and 16 wings and it, or all these limbs. And they're so out of control. Um, they don't know how to rest the beast back under control. And they start and they start and they start, but they cannot finish. And so they come to me to help them f- find a way to organize and um, 
apart from the noise and chaos of a brain that is so busy all the time. Um, and that's actually the easier job. The more difficult one is the aspiring author who has the same overwhelming and um, irresistible compulsion to write. But for one reason or another, which is normally linked to harm having been done to them at vulnerable times of their psychic development, they are so paralyzed by fear, by anxiety, by a um, a lack of self-belief and a feeling that who wants to hear what I have to say anyway. And this paralysis becomes rusted in where they actually uh, find it impossible to break through. Now, that's much more difficult to um, solve because you need to help them overcome decades of um, self-harm, self-psychic harm. And the worship that nearly always is a thoughtless and unkind criticism in the past or having been brought up in uh, in a family that doesn't celebrate and support its children. Yes. I think there are a lot of perfectionist tendencies as well that can really cripple people. Absolutely. You know, I'm a perfectionist myself. And so it's a lifelong struggle for me to overcome that. I always want to be the best at everything that I do. And I always want everything to be perfect. But it is something that I have overcome in myself by embracing the the glorious chaos of creativity and I'm I'm constantly searching for new ways to help me do that. So things like writing poetry, for example, or doodling. Um, I'm a mad doodler (laughs) and I have all sorts of ways that I um, overcome this paralysis of perfectionism myself and so that's what I try and pass on through my teaching is to give others the same techniques that have worked for me. The main thing, though, anyone who's listening now that suffers from that sense that they have been silenced in the past, just ask yourself, who is it that has tried to keep you silent? And what do they gain from your silence? Because all of us have a story to tell. All of us have a right to tell that story. All of us should be seeking to tell our story in the truest and most authentic way possible to us, which has got nothing to do with what other people think or feel. It's got everything to do with us being true to ourselves and our story. Who out there wants you not to do it and why? And once you interrogate that, you'll find that telling your story is the very, very best revenge that you can have on anyone who's tried to cripple you or hold you back from being your best self. That person probably isn't as invested in your failure as you think. No, that's exactly right. Often that that unkindness, that psychic wound, was thoughtless rather than malicious. And either way, whatever motivated it, it has got nothing to do with you. It's got more to do with them. And the common thread that you seem to be saying there with doodling or writing poetry is doing, doing something. Yes, because you learn by doing. Um, the only way you can learn is by making mistakes, usually again and again and again and again. Before you learn. But don't be scared um, to make them, um, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and, and the other thing is, is um, a lot of people think that the point of writing is the end product. But it's not. The point of writing is the writing itself. It's your own journey of discovery is what you find out about about yourself, your story, and the world that you have created, where most of the joy comes from. And um, I get a lot of people who come to me who basically want me to write the book for them so it will get published and then it will have their name on it, which, of course, I have absolutely no interest whatsoever in doing. But two, that's not the point of it. The point of it is to write your story and no one else can do that but you. So, Kate, when the idea of the novel comes to you, and I don't know if it works in the same way for each of the novels that you've written, what then comes first for you? Is it diving into 
the research? Is it traveling to the places you need to go? Is it the character? Is it getting the picture down? What comes next? Okay, so um, the first genesis of an idea is always story for me. Um, the story grabs my attention. So the first stage is what I call daydreaming the story to life. So this involves, yes, research, um, a lot of reading, a lot of thinking, a lot of daydreaming. Um, I begin to build character. I begin to build my world. Um, I begin to explore possibilities. Um, the research and reading helps give me my story um, and it helps me build my world. And that helps me build my characters because um, characters, you know, our, our human psyche is very much formed and shaped by the milieu in which we live. And um, you only have to see the spirit of young women today and think how different that same young woman would have been if she'd been brought up 500 years ago in a strict Lutheran German family. And not only are we constructed by our society, but our society can harm us. So I, I'm always thinking, how are my characters shaped and misshapen by the society which has formed them? Now, if I don't understand their milieu, if I, I don't know where and when they were born and raised and how they live, how can I create character? And the other thing is, until I understand character, how can I build plot? Because uh, plot is character in motion, and I need to understand how my characters grow and change over the course of the book before I can plan what forces are going to enact that change for them. So they're all, you know, cogs in a machine that drive each other. They're interconnected, and I build them together. So. On one day, I might be spending a whole lot of time thinking about character and playing with ideas and, and so forth. And then I'll go on and work on a different aspect of the story. But meanwhile, I'm thinking, thinking, thinking about it all the time. Um, getting to know your characters is like making friends with someone. You don't do it all on the very first encounter. You, you know, slowly they reveal things to you that help you understand them. And once you understand their backstory, then you begin to understand them. And so I'm constantly asking myself questions like, for example, what is it that they desire? What is, you know, what is the one thing that they long for more than anything else in the world? What is something that happened in their past that has caused them hurt? Because I'm always interested in people's shadow selves. What is their major flaw? What's their major strength? I don't sit down at 9 a.m. on a Monday and you know, an hour later, I have built a character. Sometimes it takes me a year, which is one of the reasons why writing is so slow. I I like to delay the writing of a book until I have a very strong sense of, of my characters, of their voice, of their struggles, of their journey. And I guess I need to have my thematic structure, which is very, very important to me in the way that I work. Sometimes my thematic structure comes more slowly. And so I'll, I would have begun writing and playing and experimenting um, while I'm searching for my thematic structure. But once I have my thematic structure, then the whole book begins to work. And so when a story is not working, it's because I haven't got the structure right. Can you give us an example of your thematic structure using either the Crimson Thread or another? Because that's such an interesting concept. Okay, so let's have a look at Bitter Greens. Bitter Greens is a reimagining of the Rapunzel fairy tale set in Renaissance Venice and um, interwoven with the true story of the woman who wrote the tale as it is best known. Her name was Charlotte Rose de Clermont de la Force. She was a noble woman at the court of Louis the Fourteenth, and she wrote her story, which is called Personnet, while she was banished to a convent. So she was imprisoned while she wrote a book about a maiden imprisoned in a tower. Now, I began wanting to retell Rapunzel, and I knew that I wanted to 
have one point of view being that of the maiden in the tower and one being the witch who locks her there. But I, I wanted to have three narrative threads that were braided together, um, just like the long plait, the impossibly long plait of hair, which is the central motif to the Rapunzel fairy tale. Now, it would have been an obvious and easy choice to have combined it with the mother. The three women at the heart of Rapunzel are the maiden, the mother, and the crone. But I never like to do uh, the obvious. Easy, the obvious. Because particularly when you're retelling a story that everyone thinks that they know, um, it, you know, everyone thinks that they know Rapunzel because they don't really. Everyone thinks that they do. So where's your suspense and where's your surprise? Suspense and surprise are the two most essential ingredients for any story. I have to destabilize the reader's expectations. I have to make them realize that I'm going to be doing something that is not predictable right from the very beginning. So I couldn't make the obvious choice. And so I was searching for my third narrative thread for quite a long time, at least a year, until I stumbled upon, in the course of my, of my research and thinking and reading, stumbled upon the story of Charlotte Rose de Clermont de la Force. And the moment that I found her, I knew that I had my third story. And of course, she ran away with the story. She's my protagonist. And um, the book is infinitely more interesting because she's in it. It was also infinitely more difficult to write. I know. It's a very complex structure. Yeah. But I feel that it works really, really well. Because it does. Because you do narrative threads. And um, every step of it is made surprising and unpredictable because of the conjunction of the three very different women. Their voices are very, very different. And that's an important part of my process is building a clear voice. So Charlotte Rose Dinner Force is, she's intelligent, she's highly educated, she's sophisticated, she is uh, witty, she is strong-minded, she is sexy. Um, Margarita, the my maiden in my tower, she was locked away as a child, so her voice, you know, is is far simpler, far more childish, and and far more wistful. And the voice of the witch, who was a courtesan in Venice in Renaissance time, is far more worldly, damaged, cynical, and you know she's she's driven very much by strange desires. I mean, she was absolutely wonderful to write, okay. but oh my. God, you know, I had to just, you know, I just had to do it yes. because her voice was so strong. And so I had to, you know, exorcise her as if she really was a demon. Anyway, so that's, that's a bit of good wings. Three narrative threads plaited together. Um, the blue rose, um, the thematic structure for that came because I was kind of doing a brainstorming. Um, exercise around the idea of blue. So, of course, The Blue Rose is a, a fictional story of impossible love set during the French Revolution and against the background of the true story of the British Embassy to China, in which um, it was kind of industrial espionage. They went to steal all of China's secrets. And um, it's particularly concerned with the bringing back of the first um, true red rose. People say, well, if it's about a red rose, why is it called the blue rose? Blue rose. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, of course, you, you need to read the book. But riffing off the idea of blue, it gave me a way of dividing the, the action of the book into, so I have Blue Blood, which is the story of um, Vivian, an aristocratic young woman, um, you know, Blue Murder, um, you know, A Wonder Tale is called A Blue Tale, just little things like that. Um, and again, once I had the thematic structure for that, then the story began to fall very, very swiftly and easily into place. 
while sometimes it takes me a long time to get the structure right. How does the how important is the title in terms of directing the theme for you? Absolutely crucial. Absolutely central. And I can't wait until I have the right title. And sometimes finding the right title can take me quite a long time. And um I have a very, very visual imagination. So um sometimes with my students, I know they have the wrong title for their book. And that's simply because I can't see the cover of it. If I can imagine the cover of the book straight away, then I know that the title is working. I can't write until I have my opening line and usually my closing line. I can't write till I have a very clear sense of the narrative structure, which is different from the thematic structure. So how are they different? The narrative structure is simply the order in which, you know, what happens and the order in which you reveal it on the page. And um, narrative structure is integral to the reader's engagement and narrative emotion. So if you don't get your structure right, the story is poorly paced, um, it has scenes in it that you don't need, it doesn't have scenes that you should have, and I always say that to plot simply means to conceive of and arrange the incidents of a story. So conceiving it is normally easy. It's arranging it where the true craft comes in. What's your first scene? What's your last scene? What are your key turning points? What are your key emotional beats? Who gets to be a point of view character? All, all of this is, um, is narrative structure. Thematic structure is kind of deeper, um, more symbolic, and um, it kind of works away in the reader's subconscious where they begin to see underlying links between things that are not said. I think what I call silences are very important in any piece of narrative. What's not said is as important as what is said. And thematic structure is one of the ways not to say something that you want the reader to know. That's a terrific explanation. So, Kate, where do your famous notebooks come into all of this? Because you're dreaming up the structure and the research and the threads and the characters and it's all coming together in this dreaming. But you can't keep it all in your head, can you? No, exactly. My, my books are too complex. So I'm a notebooker. Um, that's the way that I like to work. There's a couple of reasons for that. One is um, I've always been a mother and um, it's much easier for me to work um, in the park, um, in a sand pit with a child in a notebook than in a computer. I had my laptop stolen out of the back of my pram once and that, you know, I was very poor, couldn't really afford a laptop at all. And then, of course, I had a, the only copy, only version of a book on that laptop. Um, I, I travel a lot and, um, so it means I can write anywhere, anytime. And the main reason why I love my notebooks is because it's a visual record of the creative journey. And so I'm constantly able to go back and reread my earliest ideas, reacquaint myself with it. And, um, it's a record of my research as well. So I, I take all my research notes, um, I have a very visual imagination, so I'm always sticking in maps and images. I like to make them pretty, um, though my handwriting is so bad, they're never really going to be pretty. Anyway, um, I have a different notebook. Uh, I'm just looking. This is my notebook for the book I'm working on now. Gorgeous. And, you know, just opening it, it at random. Maps. So we've got maps, lots of writing. Yeah. This is what I like to call my ideas book. So as you can see, it's pretty thick. And so whenever I get an idea for a new novel, I, I write it in here. I'm never without an idea because I've been doing this since, I mean, my gosh, um, 2005. Wow. That book. Yeah. Oh my goodness. So for example, this is the idea for the book I'm writing now. Once I've got more than two pages, I know it, it needs its own book. 
So that is a gorgeous, just because this is a podcast, that is a gorgeous hardcover bound book. You know, beauty is really important to me. Yes. My first dozen books were just written in old notebooks, but they don't last. They fall to pieces. And, um, and also it doesn't give me pleasure. While this, a book like this is so beautiful. Yes. So just open um, it up and just, oh, those beautiful blank pages, Kate. It must be such a yeah. joy to write in. It's, um, so these are paper blanks that are, they're my favorites, but I do buy other, uh, and this is a paper blank yeah. as well. Um, each of the notebooks has to have some kind of meaning for me. Mm-hmm. So this is my notebook, The Psyche. It's got a, a very old feel to it. And, um, Psyche is the thematic structure is built on the life of a butterfly. So it's, it's divided into four parts. I'm, I'm going to see if I can find, I know this is not much fun for anyone listening. <laughs> um, but if I can find my, um, plan for it, oh, to, wow. this, this is my plan, the book. And you can see it's got four parts to it. Um, so we have, um, over, lava, Pupa and Imago are the four stages of life. And this has just given me a beautiful thematic structure for this book. And if you can see my notebook, you can see it looks like a butterfly. And oh, it's got it does too. It. Yeah. It's absolutely beautiful. Because we are doing this on Zoom and it is being recorded for video as well, I can take this little snippet out and we can pop it on Instagram or something and people can watch that section. Oh, just that, yeah. All right. So out for that, people. Um, for me, writing, you know, because we spend so much time on, on a computer um, and, and typing, I like to write longhand as much as I can because it kind of slows you down, makes you go more deeply. And also it means that I can write in bed or in the garden or in the car or on a plane. I don't have to have Wi-Fi or electricity or my computer with me. And, um, and that means that I can more easily write in the cracks of the day. Now, I know that you're a mother as well, Michelle, and I know that um, anyone who's out there who has a family, they set up an awful lot of time and energy. And sometimes finding sustained time at the computer can be difficult. This means that I, I can write in there. Yeah, that's such a good tip. I know a lot of writers and notebook addicts, but whenever I go on holiday and I go to a bookshop or something, well, I always go to a bookshop, but I always gravitate also towards the notebook area and I have to get a set of new notebooks just so I can write longhand on holiday because, I don't know, something about being on holiday makes me always want to whip out a pen and write longhand. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I write every day um, in my diary. I've kept a diary since I was 11, which is an awfully long time ago. So I have about, on my, my bookshelf in my study, I guess I have about 60, maybe 70 volumes of my diary. And so my diary always travels with me as a matter of course. Um, and usually my notebook does as well. Complex books in, end up being two or three mm. notebooks. Um, but I don't divide the notebooks up into like character, prof or seating or anything like that. I just simply turn the page and whatever I'm thinking about or worrying about happens on page. So it's quite chaotic from the outside, but it does show how I'm slowly developing my ideas. Once I begin to write, I keep um, a very close record of my word count. So every day I write the date, the time when I start work, and my word count for the novel at the top of the page. And then as I'm writing, I might, for example, be writing a scene um, set in a castle in medieval times, and I, I describe the night spurs striking on a stone floor. And in my notebook, I'd, I'd go, what do you wear spurs inside? And what did the floor be covered with rushes? But then I don't stop writing to go and research those things because it interrupts the flow of my writing. Then I might have, I, I don't know, the lady of the castle pours him a glass of wine and I'll go, glass, silver, animal horn, question mark, keep on writing. Oh, what kind of wine would it be? This is Wales in the 12th century was, you know. This is your curious mind in but, action, Kate. Yeah, but I don't stop writing. I, I write the scene out. And then I answer all those questions that the writing has thrown up in the cracks of the day, usually when I'm cooking dinner or in bed with my iPad. 
Hey, Siri, when were glasses invented? Oh, 1,286. Siri just heard my question. There you go. And that's eyeglasses. Dutch Siri, stop listening. I think Siri is wrong because eyeglasses actually existed in ancient Rome in one form or another. Anyway. We should start calling Siri Kate. Kate knows things. My daughter says, you know, you know, she'll ask me a question and I'll go, honey, but just go and Google it. She says, you're faster than Google. <laughs> That's hilarious. So will you refer back to those notebooks? They must be very well thumbed by the time you're, you're finished. Yeah, yeah. I'm constantly referring back to them and I'm constantly overwriting them or, you know, you know, you know, quite often a page will be devoted to a question and I'll return to that page and scribble all over it. Um, it has, you know, I doodle all over my notebooks because I, you know, doodling helps me think. So, you know, they're quite messy. But not only are they a record of my creative process, but they're a, a depository of ideas and knowledge. And they're a shorthand way for me to check facts. So, for example, um, because I keep such meticulous records of my research, um, I can easily find any fact that I have have discovered and I know what book, what page, what website, whatever, you know, wherever I, I found that fact, I can go back and, and check that I've got it right. And are they in your notebooks as well? Or do you keep a digital copy of your research as well? Everything is kept right. in the notebooks, every single aspect of it. And then, for example, my timelines, it's one of the first things I start to do. And then let's say I'm reading another research book and I'm adding things to my timeline. I, I write them on and then I type them up and I print out my timeline and I stick it in, in the book and then add and add and add, type it up, print it up, stick it in the book. So you can see my timeline growing and changing. And as I write scenes, I cross them off and my next timeline will not necessarily contain what I've already right. dealt with. So it's continually growing and developing as I work. So since you brought up research, Kate, I love how the research, it's so seamless on the page, but it adds such depth to your stories. You not only weave in these fascinating myths and fairy tales and legends, but you're able to add such specificity to the story. And it's right through this novel, The Crimson Thread, but all your novels. Early on in The Crimson Thread, when the soldiers go to Libya, you've written a line, dust whirled in tiny tornadoes, encrusting nostrils and ear walls, turning the seams of their uniforms to sandpaper. You can feel it, you can smell it, you can taste that sand. I can imagine you would spend years, actually. You could, because there's so much detail in these, from the way that the soldiers dyed their hair with walnut dye to resemble Greeks and some of the Morse code and the way they sewed the Morse code into the stitches, into the embroidery and so much research. Tell me your secret. Okay. Um, so research is simply reading with a purpose. Um, and I, I love to read and I love to learn. So I really do love the research process. I generally start with a very low base of knowledge. Um, so I have to find out a lot. And I think that really helps, you know, I'm, I'm reading and discovering and, um, you know, searching things out with a, a, an acute sense of curiosity and, and desire to understand. Um, I am always interested in how it would feel to be there. I want to be transported there and I want to transport my reader with me. Um, I can't write a scene unless I see it and feel it as if I was actually there. And I can't see a scene until I've imagined myself into it. So research for me is not simply finding out the relevant facts. Research is all about um, understanding the inner lives of my characters. It's all about understanding the milieu in which my story is set knowing what it would have sounded like, tasted like, felt like. Research is all about um, searching for what I call the telling detail. So I, I would prefer, instead of writing three or four pages of description, I prefer a very swift, very vivid 
detail that encapsulates the, what I call the emotional resonance of a scene. So the one that you just read about what it would be like to be a soldier, you know, fighting in the sands of Egypt and Libya. How, how do I find that particular detail? Well, I'm a great lover of first-hand accounts, memoirs, letters, diaries, and, and part of my research always involves hunting out as many of those as I can find. Um, luckily for me, World War II is actually quite easy to find those sort of things because there were so many collections of letters by soldiers home. Each battalion had a, a dedicated diarist who every day wrote a page about their experiences of that battalion today. And so I simply went to the war memorial, found them and read them. And always, always I'm searching for the telling detail. So I'm not so interested in, you know, this many rounds of ammunition were fired. So that's interesting too. I loved the account of the battle in, um, in Greece where they were firing so much ammunition that their guns actually melted from the heat and that the, the ears of the gunners, their yes, eardrums yeah, burst. They had blood. Yes. Coming down the yeah, side of their face. That, yeah. That's exactly the kind of detail that I'm, I'm searching for. I know it instantly as soon as I find it because it makes me feel okay. something. You know, I either get, you know, a little shiver of, uh, you know, it makes me feel something. And that's what I'm searching for. So what else do I do? I have a very immersive start of research. So I like to, for example, when I'm building the character of Alenka, I would read all the books that she would have read I listen to the music that she would have listened to, which can take me a while to work out what that would be. Um, I, I eat the food and cook the food the way that she would have cooked it. My family love this. I mean, you know, they had three years of me cooking them Greek <laughs> feasts. Yeah. Um, I, I imagine who her heroes would have been, for example, who she wanted to be like. Um, so I read all of their work. Yeah, um, researching the lives of the soldiers was easy. I mean, it took time, but it was easy. But researching the lives of young women in Greece in the 1930s and 40s was very, very difficult because many of them weren't literate. Mm -hmm. And that was partly how the embroidery happened because um, I was trying to understand how young women of the time would tell yeah. their stories when they were virtually illiterate, many of them, um, and when they weren't, even if they were literate, the work, the work. Oh, Michelle, you know, these young women were slaves from dawn till midnight. In Crete, the women do all of the work and the men lolling around and smoke and drink and play music and, you know, gets waited on hand and foot. And many of them didn't have running water. They certainly didn't have, you know, many of them didn't have electricity. Their work was immense. And so I had to show that in the character of, of Alenka. She was not only making her own clothes, she was growing the silkworms and growing the flax. She was spinning it. She was weaving it. And then she was making her own clothes. So, you know, I'm interested in social history, how ordinary people lived. Peter Fitzsimons talks about that too with his books, the sights, the smells, the sounds. He calls it the three S's. He's looking yeah. for that telling detail, as you call it. It adds such depth and complexity to the novels. And it's such a good tip, I think, for authors to be able to do that and bring out. You can say so much with those telling details, can't you? Yeah, I think they're much, much better, you know, than pages yeah. of description. So when I'm, I'm mentoring the three narrative components, action, dialogue, and description, and a lot of writers um, forget about description because their friends got to slow down pace. But in actual fact, description is vitally important because it's what creates that deeply immersive reading experience, which is what most readers actually want. And so, but the trick is to use description to quicken pace, not to slow pace. And you do that by, by the telling detail. Right. Yeah. So, for example, 
the White Mountains. So Teddy, one of the characters, is very afraid of heights. He does not like it. So we get such a great sense of these White Mountains in Crete and these horrible conditions. They're steep, they're cold, they're desolate. You show us through Teddy's eyes these things. You know, he feels the scree slipping under his boots. So we know it's steep and he has this horrible kind of woozy feeling every time he looks down. And so is the way to also incorporate description to show that through the character's eyes? Yes. Oh, absolutely. This is what I mean by the emotional resonance of the scene. I'm not actually really interested so much in what it only looks like. I want to know how it makes the character feel. That's what's important. And so, yes, I mean, if you were to look around you and describe the space that you're in now, most people would, you know, describe, oh, well, let's look at my room. It's got pale green walls. It's got books and art everywhere. It's quite neat and clean, blah, 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 blah. That's not what's important at all. What matters is how it makes you feel. So some people will walk in here and go, my God, this is the most beautiful and inspiring room. I, this is what I'm aspiring to. And other people will come in and go, oh my gosh, no, this makes me feel overwhelmed. There's too much visual stimulation because, you know, they need things very calm and still and empty. And so that's two, two different people would have two very different emotional reactions to this space. That's what matters, not what the space actually looks like. I'll give you another example, which is, is I often speak about this. So. In my life, I've been to the Louvre in Paris four times. So the first time I went, I was a young woman in Paris on my very first overseas trip. And um, I just wandered in a daze, looking at all this great art and just, you know, so happy to finally be in Paris. And my, my main memories of it are just um, how much my feet hurt, even though I was wearing sensible shoes. And how amazed I was to finally be in Paris. So I guess I was 22 or 23. The next time I went to the Louvre, I was in Paris to research bitter greens. So Charlotte Rose de Comte de la Force was a lady in waiting to the Queen. Um, and she lived in the Louvre, which was then a palace, you know, um, and she had to wear very high heels because in, um, 17th century France, the height of your heel was um, decreed by sumptuary laws and it showed how aristocratic you were. And because she was a cousin of the king, she wore the third highest heels allowed at court with the king having the highest, then the princes, and then the princesses and duchesses. And she was a, the granddaughter of a Jew. So very high heels. And she wore enormous, enormously heavy hooped skirts so enormous that she had to turn sideways to walk through enormous doors. And she had on her head fontages, which is a, a construction of wire with lace stretched over it. And it had a wire claws that would have dug into her hair, most of which would have been fake hair yeah. anyway. And she was not permitted to sit. She had to stand on these high heels on those cold marble floors for hours and hours and hours and hours. And I was not at the Louvre as Kate. I was at the Louvre as Charlotte Rose de Comte de la Force, imagining what it would be like to live there. And in actual fact, she lived in quite a lot of squalor over the bathrooms, for example. So the next time I went, um, I went as Georgie MacDonald, who is the protagonist of my book, Beauty and Bonds. So this is set in Victorian times. At that time, the Louvre had just been opened up as an art gallery and it was stuffed full of stolen art, which had been stolen by Napoleon and his son and grandson. Um, Georgie MacDonald, uh, who was, had just married Edward Byrne Jones, the pre-Raphaelite artist, she was the daughter of a minister. She spent her childhood handing out tracts against, against drinking. And in her household, um, Shakespeare was banned because he was immoral. She would have been wearing a very plain dark gown, a little white bonnet. She might have had a little white collar, but she would, um, the Methodists thought even buttons were signs of vanity. She was very poor. 
So her boots would have been shabby and probably been resold a few times and her gloves would have been down. So imagine going to Louvre and seeing all those naked nymphs and satires romping around on these vast canvases and all the gold and the conspicuous wealth and um, immorality. Like this was quite she shocking. Would have been shocked yes. to her core. So the third time I went to the Louvre, I went as, as Georgie MacDonald, who had a very different emotional response to that scene than Charlotte Rose de Gaunt. And then the, the fourth time I went to the Louvre was um, in the skin of Viviane, a young aristocratic woman um, who was incarcerated in the Louvre because during the French Revolution, it became a prison where the king and queen were kept locked up. It was uh, a ruin. It was, you know, full of broken furniture. And the mob used to come and stand outside and press their faces against the windows and point at all the prisoners within it. And then one by one, they were all taken out to, to be guillotined. So one place, four different emotional mm. responses to that space. Mm. That's what's important. Such a great example. They're great examples, Kate. When you are writing, do you, sometimes when you go back through the editing process, do you think to yourself, I haven't really shown this through the eyes of a character. There's straight description. I need to go back and do a bit more show. Or are you at a stage in your writing career now where you just know as you're writing, this is not right. I need to bring a little bit more of the the character's emotion to this description. It's an integral and crucial part of the way that I write that I need to be always within my character's skin and writing from within them. So deep point of view is my thing. I love to write it. I love to read it. And that is why it's so important for me that I develop voice and backstory and so forth before I start writing. So I'm never writing from the outside. I'm always writing from the inside. Now, I edit very, very hard, but I'm looking at different things in my editing process than deep point of view. I tend to write scenes over and over and over again. So the first time I write a scene, I pretty much am laying down the skeleton of the scene, what I call the pattern of action. So this happened, then this happened, then this happened, then that happened. Then the next time I write the scene, I, I might be working on dialogue and, you know, weaving in what people are thinking and saying, or I might be weaving in sensory detail. Or I might be working on a different aspect of that scene. So I don't just write a scene and then let it sit. I'm constantly reworking and going back um, and weaving in new aspects of the story. Sometimes I'm in the mood for writing dialogue and sometimes I'm not. So, um, and some scenes come out pretty much the way that I want them and are barely touched. And other scenes are completely worked over dozens and dozens of times to try and get it right. There's no one way of doing something. It's a constant process. But I, I mean, I have written a lot of books and I've been writing for a very, very long time. So I have been writing all of my life and I've been published now for more than 25 years. So, you know, you do get better with practice. There's no doubt about that. I tend to edit more for pace. So I write more for sensory emotion and then I edit a pace and then sometimes in the first few times I write a scene I'm feeling my way forward trying to work out what I'm trying to say in this scene and then once I know what it is that that what is the purpose and function of that scene I go back and I strip out anything that I don't need so that's how I work um I I write slowly and steadily and then I edit very hard. And do you edit your scenes as you go? Like, do you not move on to the next scene until that scene is done? Or are we talking going back to a second draft? Both. Both. So um, particularly in the early stages. So I write a scene and then the following day, I I always reread when I wrote the night before or the day before. And um, if there are any questions that I've written in my notebook, I answer them. Um, I, I deepen and enrich the scene, and then I push the story along. So every writing session that I do, 
I improve what I've already written and I push the story along. But let's say six chapters later, I suddenly get a good idea and I go back and I weave that idea through six or seven different chapters or I set up something which needs to be done. Sometimes I'm in the mood for writing dialogue and so I rewrite 17 chapters with lots more dialogue in them. And other times I'm not feeling it. And so, you know, quite often I just put asterisk, 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 and go, you know, because I know that this scene is only half baked, but I keep on writing or I don't know something. So I put question mark, question mark, question mark. And then if I've only got 15 minutes, I simply go through and do global searches for those embedded clues and I rewrite that scene. So, you know, I tend to write in a linear fashion. But I'm also always circling back and rewriting and improving what I've already written. And it really depends on where I am in the book, what problem I'm trying to solve that particular day. So talking about your point of view, you like to write close point of view. How do you then go about deciding if it's going to be in first or third person? Um, It's one of the earliest decisions that I make usually. Um, it's an integral part of my planning process. So, um, the wild girl, I began writing that in first person point of view. But the problem, you know, one of the major limitations of, of first person point of view is you can't really use the objective narrator, which is a really, um, handy, you know, writing tool. Um, and, the story was too big for that. And so I rewrote it. You know, I changed my mind. And so quite often in the early stages of a book, I'll write a scene one way and then I'll write the same scene from a different point of view and I'll write the same scene from, you know, close first person or from third person to, to see how the energy works. Um, and so the early stages of the book, I might have the same scene, you know, written three or four different okay. ways. Um, and change my mind and, and play with it. I, I call my first draft my discovery draft because I'm a big believer in play and experimentation. So, for example, in The Crimson Thread, I had a whole scene um, that I wrote from the point of view of a raven just playing with the idea. I ended up pulling it out and turning it into a poem, which is a quite separate art form, but um, I like to push the boundaries of what you can and can't do. The, the Beast Garden was also written in first person close and it just didn't work. And I knew it wasn't working, but I didn't know why. I said before it was one of the most difficult books I've ever written. And that was because I couldn't get the voice right. But what do you um, put that down to looking back? To me, it's just part of the creative process. Um, I, I sometimes feel the story knows itself really, really well. Um, but then I get my own ideas about what the story should be and I try and force the story to do what I want it to do and it just means I'm not listening okay. enough. But the story speaks to me through my body and so if I, I'm struggling with it, it's not working, there might be more than one reason why it's not working and it might take me a while to find a solution to that. So the Beast Garden didn't work because I had chosen the, the wrong narrative position, i.e., I changed it from first person close to third person multiple. I rewrote the entire book in the course of six weeks from one to the other. And I mean, I had to write in the scenes from different points of view. But can I tell you the moment that I knew what I'd done wrong, I knew what I had to do and the writing came very swiftly and easily. But when I'm struggling, it's because I'm doing something wrong. When I say wrong, I mean something the story doesn't want to be. A Bit of Greens is written with two first-person points of view and one third-person point of view, which is a very unusual creative decision and narrative position. But if you've read the book, you will know why I've made that particular choice in it. The book I'm writing now, Psyche, is, um, I've, I've pretty much settled into first-person close. It's really working for me and I'm really loving it. Single point of view? Single point of view. That's what I mean. When, when I say close, I mean yeah. a single point of view. So the wild girl is third person close. Psyche is first person close. The beast garden is third person multiple. Booty and fawns is um, 
third person multiple with four different points of view, all of which have very different voices. Wow. I, I, I'd like to complicate my task. What <laughs> <I say? laughs> Some writers just love one or the other, and that's what they always do. Yeah. But other writers like me, I like to find the best form for the story. I know that something a lot of writers struggle with is how to incorporate backstory. Is that something that you have thoughts on, Kate? I'm sure you do. Yeah, yeah. of course. I have thoughts on everything. <laughs> He's a teacher. Yeah, yeah, but not just as a teacher. It's, it's because I'm such a, an avid reader. And so because I read so much and I'm reading all the time and I have read all of my life, um, I have seen what works on the page for me and what doesn't. And so reading is, is of course, a highly subjective task. And the kind of book that I love is not necessarily the same as another reader will love. But for me, I prefer to have backstory slowly revealed and to not have too many flashbacks because flashbacks interrupt narrative flow and narrative flow is very, very important to the way that I write. I, I, I like my readers to feel that they have been swept up and they've been carried along and it, it, it's kind of like an irresistible force. And so anything that interrupts narrative flow, I will always make a different creative choice at time. Not to say I don't use flashbacks because I do, because flashbacks are simply memories. And all of us, our brain is constantly throwing up memories to us. Um, but I prefer um, not to do it that way. For me, backstory is crucial to understanding the psyche of my characters and crucial for my readers to understand the psyches of my characters. So I, I usually have really very well-developed backstories. So, for example, you were talking about um, Teddy and his fear of heights in The Crimson Thread. Well, the story of his father um, and his father being, you know, crippled and injured during an earlier war. This is an integral part of Teddy's character, his fear of heights, his complex emotions towards his father, his fear of impotence and being, and being crippled his determination to um, retain power for himself. Or, I mean, it's his backstory that helps us understand him. I know Teddy's backstory and I know Jack's backstory and I know Alenka's backstory, but I can't think of how I know that because you do it so seamlessly. When I look at The Crimson Thread, it's not a thick book. It's How many words is that, Kate? A nine About 100,000 words. 100. But it feels like it could have been double that size because of how much you've crammed in, but so seamlessly. Like, yeah. this book is a masterclass, really. I think people should read this just to see how that's done. Yeah. I mean, thank you so much. That's so lovely of you to say so. On every page, every single page of every mm-hmm. single book, I am weaving together a dozen different threads. And so on every page, you need glimmers of more than one thing. So each scene has to have a clear function. But um, if each scene is not propelling your plot forward, developing character, which includes backstory, and building your world, then that scene is simply not doing enough. It has to do more. And then each scene has to, you have to have, the, the outer world and the inner world in every single scene, in every single page, you need to have a balance between what's happening on the outside of your characters and what's happening to them on the inside as well because it's the inner life of your characters that is, is your true story. But a, a book that's only about what people are thinking and remembering is a bloody boring book. So you, you need the inner and the outer in constant tension between each other. And that's where the art comes in. So, and, and my other thing is, is um, my readers, I said before that when I begin my research, I'm coming from a, a place of complete ignorance. Well, so are my readers. True. They know nothing when they begin. And by the end of the book, they should be able to give a lecture on the subject. But if there's any point where they feel that they've been lectured or that I, I've done a copy and paste from Wikipedia, mm. then I have failed at the art of the work. So slowly, step by step, I need to 
drip feed the backstory of my of my setting and my world as much as the backstory of my characters whilst maintaining pace <laughs> while well, maintaining pace while also creating setting while also you know <laughs> making sure that the, the conflict and drama between the characters is also present on every single page. So it's a very delicate weaving together of more than one element at a time. And it's that difficulty that I love about writing. Yeah. And I, I must admit the fact that I'm constantly going over and like, you know, each time I rewrite a scene, I'm weaving in a different aspect. I don't expect my first draft to do everything. It's the, it's a constant rewriting that enables you to get that subtlety and to very, very slowly teach the reader what they need to know to understand what's going on. So because you're such an experienced and accomplished writer and editor as well, and you do have the ability to turn that strict editorial eye on your own work, what then do your outside editors bring to the work? It's a really, really good question, Michelle, and, and one that I wish was asked often. So um, I believe certain things about writers. I believe that the writer is the creative artist and that they are responsible for all creative decisions in their work. I believe that the creative artist needs to have a very clear sense of what it is that they want this work to be doing. And my aim is to bring to my publishers and agents and editors the most perfect book that I am capable of producing at that point in time. So I work very, very hard that, to try and make the work of my editorial team as easy as possible. Because if they're going through and having to, you know, fix my grammar and where my, you know, where my commas go and, you know, change the spelling, you know, because I, I've been sloppy in my work, then that's all they're doing. And all they're doing is polishing up the surface of it. Well, what I want them to bring to my work is a cool, clear eye to see the things that I cannot see and to show me how to teach me how to be a better writer. So um, I've worked with um, the same editor at Penguin Random House for many, many years now. He, I, I trust him absolutely and implicitly. He knows me. He knows what I do well and he knows what I can do better. And anything that um, he queries or, um, or points out to me, I spend quite a lot of time thinking about and taking on board because I know he wants me to be the best writer that I can be. And I know that he wants the book to be the best that it can be. So my role in that relationship is one of listening and learning. And his role is the one of seeing what I cannot see because I'm too close to the work. So I, I, I don't do everything that is um, suggested to me at all, but I do most of it because if I know that he's a highly intelligent and insightful reader. And if he, if I fail on the page to make him think or feel what I want him to think or feel, then I have failed. And exactly the same with my agents and publishers. I am very, very lucky that my publisher takes um, a very active role in the book as well. So I, I tend to get the feedback of my agent, my publishers and my editors. They don't always agree. Okay, that must be but, interesting. <laughs> Do you have to be I, the decider then? Absolutely. Like, yeah. I think that the, the creative artist needs to be the agent of their own success. They need to retain um, control over every aspect of what they do. Whenever I hear someone say, oh, that's the editor's job, I just quietly shake my head because it's not their job, it's your job. And then because... One, because I, I deliver a highly finished piece of work that's entered within an inch of, mm. of its time. <laughs> and two, because I listen very respectfully and I'm eager to be better, I have a very, very beautiful relationship with my publishers and editors. That's wonderful, Kate. 
And it's such an important point to make, I think, because it's not a them versus us situation. And I think some people do go into it with a bit of a combative, particularly if they're new to the industry and they've not been around the publishing industry and this is their first time. I think that, you know, some writers can have an unhealthy relationship with their own work, but no, words are only words and there are many thousands more words. And to get so violently attached to a scene or a sentence or an aspect of your own writing that you are not prepared to realize that it could be done better is to actually shackle yourself and to diminish the possibility of you learning to be a better writer. Like writing is a lifelong journey of discovery and learning. I'm constantly learning and I'm constantly seeking to learn and I hope to do so until I reach the end of my life. To The, the moment that you start thinking you know what you're doing is a moment that the art will begin to suffer. The greatest dangers to the creative spirit uh, I believe, predictability and smugness. I work constantly to make sure I'm never smug and never predictable. <laughs> because that old saying, pride comes before a fall, is guaranteed to get you. <laughs> Every single book that I have ever written has been, I, I've had to learn how to write again. Because every book throws up different problems and different challenges. And every book, you learn how to write it by writing it. I was going to ask you what writing, because The Crimson Thread is, I don't know, 40-something novel? I think it's about number 46. 46. Did writing The Crimson Thread teach you anything new about writing? Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, There are a few things that I've done in The Crimson Thread which I've never done before. So I have four different points of view and three of them are men, even though my protagonist um, is a woman and and her story and her voice is dominant. Um, it, it is unusual for me to have three quarters of my point of view characters being male. Um, and so that was a challenge for me, um, to bring into life, to make their voices authentic, to, it, you know, imagine, it, particularly when we're talking about desire, male desire, which is an important part of this book. Um, to, um, the, the way that I used the myth was a little bit different in this book than I've used it before. So quite often I think of my uh, retelling of the fairy tale or the myth as the shadow story, which is hidden within the primary narrative. But um, because Crete is a country that is so deeply steeped in myth, I found it appearing in all sorts of different and unexpected ways. Um, for example, um, a lot of people forget that the Icarus myth, the story of the boy who flew too close to the sun, is actually part of the Minotaur in the Labyrinth myth. It's, it's, um, a satellite myth, you might want to call it. And of course, the story of World War II is a story of arrogance and pride and, and, and hubris. And what did I, I discover, but that, um, you know, the Icarus dance is uh, a dance usually danced by men in Crete. Uh, and, you know, p- people get murdered. If you interrupt the dance, it can set up a family vendetta. I didn't know that when I began working on this book, but that all of a sudden I'm finding this myth strangely all the way through it. And then, of course, um, Crete is remarkable in the history of human war because it's the only battle that began with an invasion from the air, which is extraordinary. So um, it kept cropping up in all sorts of interesting and unexpected ways. Yes, exactly. It's funny how that happens. It's so serendipitous, but in the most delightful way. Yeah, you know, when serendipity and synchronicity are working with me on a book, that's how I know that I'm telling the story I'm meant to tell because it feels as if the universe wants you to tell this book or the muse, however you want to describe it. And you make all these astonishing discoveries that you didn't know that you needed until you make that discovery. 
So again, a lot of my research is me simply searching for that kind of discovery, that kind of new insight and understanding of what it is that I'm actually doing and what my story is actually about. Yeah. I mean, even the words, the crimson thread, just talking about the eardrums that had blown out and there was this trickle of blood down the side of people, that I sort of immediately went, oh, that's a crimson thread. And as well as all the women helping the men and all the thematic connections with the crimson thread and labyrinth myth, where all these other sort of symbolic little moments throughout. Exactly. So um, one of the first things I do when I'm writing a book is I do a mind mapping exercise. I'm actually going to grab my crimson thread notebook. Oh, lovely. So this is it. This is my crimson thread. Um, This is the first volume. You can see it's got a, a one on the side. And so one of the earliest things I did was a mind mapping exercise. So I knew I was dealing with um, the central symbol in the Mediterranean in the labyrinth is um, the red thread given by Ariadne to Theseus to help him kill. And so I've just taken the word red and then I've, I've riffed off it. And, you know, one of the things that I found, for example, is that um, red, you know, cochineal, is a red dye made from the blood of insects that, that are crushed. And that then the cut of crimson is um, a dye made from the, the dried bodies of scale insects. Oh. So I had this link between, you know, crimson and blood and also sacrifice that I found really, really interesting. Well, there is that notion of sacrifice as well. The, the, the people of Crete, at one point, they bring a traitor out and they say, how could you not fight for your country? How could you not sacrifice your yourself for, for your country? Because that's so heavily imbued in the, the way they think. That's exactly right. And this was an important part. So here I've got, you know, riffing off the colour red, I've got here, you know, cardinals, the blood of Christ, saint to master self-sacrifice. Then um, down here, I've got this idea of blood war. And, you know, blood led me to the Umbilical cord, um, mothers and children, uh, dark crime fiction, you know, domestic noir, female orientated, the family as a cauldron of crime. And these are all ideas generated by the, you know, and this, I, I, this is maybe page, page seven in my, in my first notebook. So, so many of the themes and ideas generated in this one brainstorming, um, exercise. And um, this led me to the um, knowledge that in Greece, red is a color that brides wear and red is, um, a, is deeply linked to their, um, ideas of luck. And then I found out that, um, Greek fairy tales begin with this idea of, you know, red thread bound on the spinning wheel round, spin the wheel, let the tale begin. And so that ends up being the first lines of my book. So this one mind mapping exercise generates themes and ideas that are then woven through the entire 100,000 words of the novel. And it gave you your first critical line. Yeah, that's why I can't write till I have my first line. Yeah. So, I mean, I experiment. I I might um, have 17 different possible first lines, but as soon as I get it, I know it. And then because it's the very first point of contact between reader and story it's absolutely crucial in building that relationship kate you've been so generous with your time and i'm aware that time is marching on i have a question from a listener anna loder did you ever do an event at anna's shop around the corner of course anna's such a delightful woman i adore her she is very curious to know more about why you start your books on a new moon. Okay. Um, a lot of people find this fascinating and it's kind of complex. So I, it's, it's not just a new moon. I use all the phases of the moon in my writing. Um, partly it's got to do with kind of word witchery. This idea that, um, you know, the new moon is, um, symbolically um, a powerful time to start a new project. And, um, the dark of the moon is, is not a good time to start a new project. Well, that's good to um, know. Yeah. So, um, in, in ancient times, people used to 
you know, sow seeds in the new moon, but they wouldn't sow them any other time. Um, a full moon is a time of enormous kind of magical power. And so um, I might try and might um, or begin certain scenes at that time. But from a practical point of view, it means that I can set a date that I want to be ready to start writing by. Um, I can look and see what else I've got to do because I do a lot of other things apart from writing. Um, so it, it, it means I can clear the decks, clear my desk, clear my inbox that I, I know I want to start, um, the book itself or perhaps a new section of the book or a new chapter. I like to start anything new on the night of the new moon. And so it, it, it means I've got a deadline to begin work or to begin a certain task. And so I will work very hard to make sure I'm fully equipped to write that new scene or that new chapter or section or book at that time. Um, it means that I can um, say no to other people asking me to do work because I, I know that I want to be fully concentrated on the task. And um, so you know, practically it helps me clear the decks and make sure that I'm ready. And then it means I come to my work with a strong sense of anticipation. I know what I'm going to be writing. I've spent the last few weeks preparing myself for it, um, imagining myself into the scene. You've done all the dreaming side of things and the notebooks are there. It's all ready to rock and roll. Yeah, exactly right. And so I come into my writing space ready, eager, knowing that today is the day that I'm going to write this particular scene. You know, some of the scenes which are really, really difficult that I've been procrastinating writing because I know they're going to be too too harrowing. Um, it means that I can prepare myself I, and make sure that I'm in a safe space emotionally speaking. Um, I quite like to write very dark and difficult scenes in the dark of the moon. So, for example, uh, when I wrote uh, The Witches section of Bitter Greens, it seemed appropriate to me to write that in the dark of the moon and I'd been dreading writing it. And so then I was able, like I, I did nothing but write it and that whole section, which is actually a really quite a large section of, of the book, I wrote in all at the same time. So not in one sitting, but mm-hmm. let's say a couple of weeks just writing that scene. And then I was able to get it out of my system clear the decks, prepare myself, and then be able to start the next task, which was the weaving together all the elements of the book on a new moon. I think some writers would think that putting so much pressure on myself to sit down and say, today's the day, crack the knuckles, open up the blank document. But you're saying that a combination of preparedness and curiosity and openness to your creativity is what gets you to the desk to sit down and start writing. Exactly. You know, um, we all have, have very, very busy lives and we all have a lot of balls in the air. And so it also helps me um, plan. I, of course, have deadlines. Um, I need to plan out how the book's going to be written and how much I have to have written by various periods in time. And it helps me schedule my writing and helps me write in flow. So, you know, writing in flow is an enor- enormous part of my creative process. And by this, I mean that once I start writing, I'm writing swiftly, fluidly, and I'm, I'm feeling very empowered and aware of what I'm doing. And I'm, you know, all those threads I was talking about, about before, I am able to weave them all together very, um, fluidly and easily on the page. Now, the only reason that I can do that is because I'm properly prepared for it. You know, um, and, and this is just one aspect of, of that being prepared, coming to my sacred writing time and my sacred writing space, feeling very, very empowered and aware. So what's next for you, Kate? Your next book is due soon? It's due, um, the middle of next year. So I've been working away on it fairly steadily, um, amidst everything else I've been doing. I do have an awful lot of balls in the air. Um, but I had my last public appearance last night, then my last podcast with you today, and then I, I'm doing a book club appearance on Thursday night, and then I'll be doing nothing else but writing 
between now and July next year. So no teaching coming up? No teaching coming up. Sorry, sorry, people. You can't get Kate for a while. Not live. You can do my self-paced recorded classes. Oh, yes. Tell us about that. Yeah. So one of the things I've been doing this year is working towards um, recording all of my most popular workshops. Um, There's a number of different reasons for this. One is um, I'm an internationally published author. And so a lot of people who want to learn with me are in different time zones for me. And um, I've had so many people like from Germany and Ireland and the US, you have to get up at 3 a.m. to do a live course with me and then go and have to you know, deal with their day afterwards. All of them were begging me to record it so that they could do it in their own um, time space. The second one was that my most popular courses sell out so enormously quickly. Um, I think the record was um, my Dare to Dream course sold out. They opened it up and within four minutes it was fully booked. And then we have these enormous wait lists. And if I'm only teaching that once or maybe twice a year, they've got to wait six months and I'm going to teach it again. And so this means that we don't have to have wait lists. We don't have to, you know, we can just sell as many as people want to do it. And previous, um, when I'm writing, um, you might have, you might have noticed, Michelle, that I do have a very obsessive nature. And so when I'm writing, I want to do nothing but write. Um, and so it means that I tend not to do anything else during that time. And then there are so many people who, who want me to teach or to do other things. And it means that I'm not, you know, saying no all the time which I find quite hard to do. So how can people find out about those courses, Kate? Where are they available? Um, so we're hoping the first of them will be available uh, probably at the end of January. Oh, great. Um, but my website, um, if you go to the events page on my website, you will see I've got a note there saying that um, I've now finished all my public events for the year. But the moment that we know that they're done and they're ready to be viewed, I will load them up. Um, but if, if you just follow me on social media, I'll be constantly um, letting people know what's going on. And people can sign up to your newsletter as well? Yes, people can sign up to my newsletter. And if anyone who signs up to my newsletter gets notice of what I'm doing ahead of anybody else, which used to be really, really important with the workshop. That's why things um, set out so fast. Because <laughs> I sent out a newsletter going, by the way, this course, we're opening it up at 9.30 a.m. tomorrow. And people go, Bam. But it does mean that if I'm doing any live events, um, my VIP club members hear before anybody else does. And I tend to, um, you know, for example, my book launch was a private event, but I, I gave away six seats and, you know, to people who were in my newsletter, which was a much nicer, I think, than having it being, you know, open to anyone. You're like the Taylor Swift of the literary world, Kate. Filling out in minutes. I know, I know. But I think there's just such a hunger in the world to find yeah. someone to help and to um, shine the light and illuminate. You know, creativity is a mystery. And um, particularly when our, our faith in ourselves has been really um, shaken, finding someone who can help you restore that faith in yourself and in your story and teach you how to do it, I think there's a real hunger out there for that and that's one of the reasons why my courses do get so quickly yes I think also you're not only great on this sort of practical writing craft and process and techniques but you're a very nurturing person by nature and you're terrific on the dreaming side of things and the creative flow and all of those kinds of things that don't necessarily get taught in general writing classes so yeah that's thank you I I should also say that on your website, your blog is excellent. Um, just talking about point of view before, I know you've written an excellent blog post on point of view where you talk about the wild girl and how you made decisions about points of views for different pieces of your writing. Um, so I would point people towards that. I'm going to put all of these links in the show notes as well. It's such a gold mine, Kate's blog. And I, um, I had a very popular one recently where I was talking about the world of free. Um, you know, where it comes from and how, how we use it in our writing. And honestly, um, it was, it was just shared so widely 
I was amazed. I have two blogs. I have uh, a record of my reading and then I have my writing journal. And my writing journal is not just about writing, it's about creativity. And they are both on your website at kateforsyth.com.au. Kate, Thank you so much for your generosity today with not only your time, but your knowledge. The listeners are going to get so much out of this. It's going to be something people can read your novels and come back and listen to and get so much from. Thank you so much for having me, Michelle. It's just been a pleasure. And I look, I just hope that you and your family have the most beautiful, beautiful Christmas and summer. Thank you. And same to you, Kate. There you go. I hope you enjoyed my chat with the wonderful Kate Forsyth. I got so much out of that episode and I hope you did too. The Crimson Thread is a great read and the perfect novel to sink into this summer. So make sure you pick up a copy wherever you buy your books. You'll find all the show notes for today's episode right here in your podcast app or on the website at writersbookclubpodcast.com. I'm currently staying in the Byron hinterland on Bundjalung country where I've been swimming in creeks and lying under trees and of course always with a book close by. I hope you've all had a beautiful break as well over the summer. I want to wish all of you a really brilliant 2023 doing all the things you love. Hopefully that involves some writing. For me, I have a few things in the works. Many of you will know that I'm a website designer in my day job and I specialize in author websites. I've already got four websites booked in over January and February, so I'm very busy already, but I'm determined to get back to my writing. I don't really talk about my own writing much on this podcast, but I'm 58,000 words into my second novel, so I'm planning to finish that and get it off to my faithful beta readers. So heads up, Inkies novel will be on its way to you hopefully this term. Like many other parents I work to term times so uh, a term is generally 10 or 11 weeks and I try and cram all my work into those weeks so that I can have some time off with my daughter who is going into high school first year of high school this year. My son's in his second year of uni so he pretty much looks after himself but um Cheska still needs me, so I'm going to work to term times for the next six years. I very much look forward to bringing you another series of deep dive interviews with your favorite authors this year. So I'll have a little break through January and then we will fire things up again in February and I'll announce my next guest um, in the first week of February. So listen out for that. I recorded today's episode on the beautiful unceded lands of the Garigal people of the Eora Nation and I'm recording this on the beautiful unceded lands of the Bunjalung people. Thanks for listening and until next time, happy writing. <laughs>